So we're back with the how to build a PC series that we started just a few videos back. That first video will be linked in the description below where we showed you guys how to go about picking all your parts for a, a new slash used computer build, something for about $600 and has a lot of value. Well, we got all the parts now and it's time to get building. My name is Chris, this is Coalition Gaming and today I'll be your computer technician. So if you guys like computer tech, hardware, gaming, tutorials, and things like that, hit that subscribe button because this is the place to be. And also hitting that subscribe button with the bell notifications, you'll, get, you'll see the rest of the videos that are coming as part of this series. So let's get to it. Alrighty, so we're going to show you guys how to build this computer, but first we are going to talk about the parts. There are a few differences from the video where we talked about ordering all these things and I just wanted to bring that up real quick. The graphics card did end up being the one that we picked out, the Sapphire Nitro RX 580. Um, we ended up getting this for $110 using the eBay best offer and already tested, works great, and man, is it clean. I'm actually really impressed. It looks like it's a brand new graphics card. So that's coming from eBay. What a great deal there. We have the, uh, the motherboard that we picked out, the, uh, what is this, ASRock B450 Gaming K4 motherboard. We changed out the SSD. This is now the Patriot 512 gigabytes uh, Scorch NVMe drive. That's a two lane versus a four lane. The RAM is now DDR4 3000 Crucial Ballistics. It was a few days before we were able to order stuff, so certain prices had changed to the point where I needed to make some adjustments. Processor still the same, Ryzen 5 2600. Power supply changed because EVGA did a midweek madness sale, so for the same price that we found that other power supply I talked about in the video, we ended up getting this guy, which is now fully modular, 650 watt. I think it's a gold rated power supply as well, so definitely an upgrade there. And then the case, they ended up going with the Deepco Matrix. I believe this is the 50. I haven't seen too many builds featuring the 50, mostly the 55 with that RGB strip in the front. The only difference that I can tell between this one and the 55 is that you don't have the RGB strip in the front, but you still have that full glass for RGB fans and all that sort of stuff. Speaking of the fans, we were just going to use some uh, run-of-the-mill cheap black fans to put into the case to keep the, prop, the price proposition at a regular rate. But Easy DIY reached out and they offered their, uh, their dual ring, I guess they call it, PWM, addressable RGB fans, but they got lost in the mail. <laughs> uh, they, haven't, they, they were supposed to come on Monday, they didn't arrive. However, I still have one left over from our RGB, uh, RGB Beast 2.0 build video that'll be linked right up here. And this is exactly what they were gonna send over. So uh, Easy DIY, I appreciate it. Maybe we'll use those in a future build, but I did wanna bring it up because we're still using one of them. The rest of the fans that are gonna be using the build were pulled out of that RGB Beast case originally as well, which are very similar fans, but they're Intermax. And that should cover everything. Let's get to building. So while the motherboard is out, there's a few important things to do first before even getting it into the case. The first thing we're gonna be doing is installing the processor and the cooler. So let's get to that. All right, so first step when installing the processor is you have to pull the zero insertion force bar up or ZIF bar, and it sort of opens the slot. And then you take your CPU and you see there's a little diamond on the top of the socket. The CPU itself also has a diamond. You just align those and drop the processor right in and there you go see diamond to diamond processor went right in then you just bring the lever all the way down to the locked position now you're ready to install the cpu cooler one thing with the ryzen cpu coolers is they they vary which way they're going to be installed so you see these plastic brackets the bigger coolers utilize the brackets the smaller ones will just screw right in and this is one of the smaller coolers so we're going to have to undo this installation here The pre-applied thermal paste in the stock cooler will generally be enough. So if you really don't want to fool around with thermal paste, which can be a rabbit hole in of itself, just stick with the, you know, the pre-applied stuff and you'll be okay. Something really important when installing a CPU cooler is doing a star pattern as you tighten the screws so that the thermal paste on the cooler will apply evenly onto the integrated heat spreader of the processor.
And then finally, you want to line up the PWM fan connector to more than likely what is the CPU fan uh, PWM header on the motherboard. It's usually going to be somewhere near the socket. On this motherboard, it's up in the corner. All you do is line it up to the tab and then slide it on. Quick tip, some motherboards don't come with the M.2 screws already in there and they're super small and super easy to lose. So uh, I already almost lost it right now. So if it doesn't come with it and you have an open NVMe slot, you should probably pre-install it. So one of my favorite things about computers nowadays is that you can get away with really awesome, really compact NVMe drives and save on a lot of cable management, no serial ATA cables or power cables. You just install it. Unfortunately, these install really easily. So just line it up into the slot and then there you go. Then that, that screw just goes in on the end on that little post. So since Ryzen CPUs take advantage of memory speed and memory bandwidth, we make we got to make sure to install the RAM in, dub, in uh, dual channel mode. So most of the time it's the first slot and in the set, uh, third slot or every other slot. You may need to refer to your motherboard manual if it's any different than that. But for this one, I'm just going to do it that way. And uh, you see that there is a little notch in the middle of the RAM stick and you just have to line it up with the notch in the dim slot. And uh, once you line it up, I believe this is right. You just slide it in, press down until it clicks, and there you go. That's one RAM stick, and that's two RAM sticks. An important step, though, when preparing your case for taking the motherboard is making sure you have your fans installed. Sometimes fan installation can be impeded by a motherboard that's sitting in the case, so it's a good idea to install the fans before you put the motherboard in. So let's go ahead and do that. You got to pop off the front panel on this case, and if it has a pre-installed fan, you're going to change out. I want to remove that one too. So checking on the fans in the RGB connectors, it turns out these Intermax fans, I can't daisy chain them. So the motherboard only supports a maximum of two 12 volt RGB fans. So I'm only going to be using two in the front and then I'll be using the easy DIY fan in the rear. Should still be good. Two intake, one exhaust is perfectly fine. Positive pressure, you'll get less dust buildup, which is nice. And if you guys want to learn more about that, I'll leave a link in the description below. And in this case, I'm actually going to be installing them behind these bars because then you have more distance to the vents in the front of the case. So you get better airflow. It would look better in the front here, but you have more restricted airflow if you do that. And airflow can be important with a case that has a sealed front panel. It only has the vents on the side. So we're putting them behind these bars in order for it to get the best airflow that it can. And uh, so this brings up an important point when you're planning your build, make sure that you have the right amount of RGB connectors or an RGB hub in case you need it. So here's the two fans in the front, spaced hopefully far enough apart, but not too close to look good for a two fan setup in the front here. But let's go ahead and get the third fan installed now. Rear fan is tightened in. Now we can get to the motherboard installation. Actually, probably the most important part of your build is making sure that the IO shield gets installed before putting in the motherboard. This can be a big problem if you forget to install it. So let's go ahead and take care of that now. Something about newer high-end boards though is that this comes pre-installed, which will take the guesswork out of it. But lower end boards, not so much. So let's go ahead and put it in. Something really important as well before installing a motherboard is making sure your standoffs line up. If you have a standoff in the spot where there isn't a motherboard hole, it can short the back of the motherboard and keep your computer from running correctly, which is pretty bad. So all I got to do is sort of look at it, maybe even sort of match the motherboard in by bringing it in and looking at how the holes line up, seeing where those standoffs are. Some, motherboard, some cases have them pre-installed, some don't. So, from what I can tell here, these are the correct standoffs for the holes here. So, everything seems to line up. Let's go ahead and screw it in. Back of the hand, here you go. All right, so then that's all the motherboard mounting screws. 
make sure you double check that you got all the screws in and all the holes or rather all the holes where there are standoffs and uh, it's pretty easy to miss one so it's not too bad if you miss one it's worse if you have a standoff behind the board that you missed but if you didn't get a screw in one of the standoffs that's not that's not too bad just make sure you double check it and get it get that in there so next is not the graphics card because that is actually something you should do last a lot of people make the mistake of putting in the graphics card after the motherboard but then having the graphics card there makes it really difficult to get the connectors on the bottom of the motherboard all seated properly so we're going to wait on that one we're going to go ahead and install the power supply now so it's nice that the power supply is modular that's what we ended up going with thank you evj midweek madness sales so as you can see, we have to plug in all the stuff that we need. A smart thing to do, especially with cases that don't have a lot of space down here, plug in your cables that you're going to be using for your motherboard and all your connections before you install the power supply. Because uh, it could be a really big headache if you do it after. So when it comes to modular power supplies as well, sometimes these are labeled and as you can see on the power connectors that go into the spots they're labeled to match so just plug them in to match and you should be good to go if they're not labeled or if you have any issues with it just refer to the manual on the power supply and you'll get all the answers that you need All right, so now that we're at this step, we're gonna connect the CPU power connector, which is up here in the corner of the board. And uh, some CPU power connectors break apart like this because some other boards only have a four pin. This one is an eight pin, but this doesn't seem to wanna connect together. So it's a little bit of a issue. Let me see if I can get it in still. All right, and now we're gonna be plugging in motherboard main power. This is the ATX 24 pin connectors you see here. And you do have to sort of fight with the connect the cable a little bit because of the angle that you're gonna be plugging it in. So in this case, I have to like sort of twist it around and then insert it there. Now we're going to connect the USB 3.0 front header connector. These ones can be a bit more unwieldy compared to the ATX24 connector because they're tall, they're sort of inflexible, but on this motherboard it's right next to it. So just line it up with the notch that's on there. It's keyed to only go in a certain way and then just uh, plug it in. There you go. Don't pull too tight back on this because you can't break it so you might have to leave it basically like that. So now we're going to be installing the front audio connectors. That's this little guy here. Usually these are marked front panel or rather HD audio. That's what they're generally marked as. You, and the, they're missing a specific pin on there. You just line it up to there. Check the labeling under there may say audio or maybe just check with your motherboard on that one. So this just goes like this. So now we're going to be installing the front USB connectors. That's this one. Again, it's keyed a very specific way. The motherboard will also say USB on it. The connector itself may say USB on it as well. So this just connects like this. There you go. So a lot of the time with the front panel connectors, you have to refer to the motherboard to make sure you get it correctly. But a lot of motherboards do have them labeled and this one does as well. So along the top, we have power LED and power button. Along the bottom, we have hard drive LED and reset switch. That's all on this connector right here, by the way. So let me find out what we have from the connector here and then we'll do that power switch. It's usually smarter to plug in the ones that will won't impede plugging in the other ones. So in this case, it means plug in the bottom ones first. Hard drive LED in the bottom left even shows which side is positive. And that's generally the lighter colored wire on here. So we're going to do it like this. Also, usually there's a little arrow on the connector. So make sure you watch out for that. Slide it on. There you go. And then uh, reset switch is on the bottom. Yes, it is. Positive is marked on the left. 
Usually my rule of thumb with this is text out. Text facing out usually works for me. So we're gonna put that there. We'll tighten the wires up here in a second. And then we have on the top, what was that? Power LED and power button. So power button, also known as power SW for switch, is on this side. And then finally the power LED which is positive and is on the left. This one is broken apart, not all of them are. So it's marked positive on the left. There's that one. And then finally, the negative. All right, and everything's all plugged in. Let's just tighten the wires up. Now it's time to plug in the fans and make sure that we plug in the RGB and the connectors in the correct spots. So on this motherboard, we have a 12 volt four pin RGB standard connector down here. So I'm going to route that over to myself down here. And then line that up. Now there's a little arrow on the marker here on the left side. So that should line up to an arrow that's on the RGB connector and that's like this. There we go. That's the RGB connector for there. And then the fan connector for that one, there's a couple of chassis fan connectors right here in the front corner of the motherboard. So let's go ahead and use those. Again, you just line, line them up to the slot, slide it in. There's that fan. Let's repeat that process for the other fan. The other fan is gonna be using the other RGB connector on the board. This is in the top over here. It's marked as the AMD LED, but that's just a four pin RGB connector like normal. All right, and we're just gonna line that up right here. There we go. So that was the RGB for that one. And then let's get the fan actually plugged in and that'll be over here on the other chassis connector. Sweet. So the rear fan on this one uses a different kind of RGB. It's called the dressable RGB. Generally, it only has three pins instead of four, like the other kind of RGB. Don't plug a, a 12 volt RGB into a five volt and vice versa. You could actually damage things like that. You don't want to damage your nice new parts that you got. So this one goes over here. So you can see in the connector, there's one pin that's blocked off to help you prevent from plugging it into the wrong one. And fortunately, this motherboard has a connector right over here by this USB connector. These are a little bit easier to figure out how to plug in because, because of the way the pins are. And since this fan is PWM four pin that can dynamically adjust its RPMs, there's a PWM fan connector on this motherboard right back here. Most have one in the back. So we're just gonna plug that right on in and then call that one done as well. So some cases don't have this kind of breakaway connector. They have all these where they screw in, sort of like the top one on this case, but uh, all I gotta do with these ones to prepare for the graphics card is sort of bend them until they break off. But be careful because they're pretty close to the motherboard and they could rub on the top of the motherboard. Just gotta be really careful like that. And now we can drop in the graphics card. There we are. Now we got to screw it into the side. The graphics card is kind of heavy, so it is something that I want to, that you would want to screw in instead of letting it float like that. <laughs> Sometimes it helps to have a buddy or another pair of hands to help you tighten things down while you hold them up. Use those muscles, Wayne. All right, last step for plugging things in would be the graphics card power. Fortunately, some cases include a cutout right where you need to route the power. So let's get the connectors over here real quick. This graphics card uses an eight pin and a six pin. So I need to connect two of the connectors. All right, and now they're both in. Gonna pull them through. Make sure not to tangle any wires or catch any other ones as you do it. And this one only needs these connectors to connect. So we're gonna do it like this. And then the other one uses these connectors. <laughs> oh, 
almost had it. And there we go. So it might be smart to do something to, with this. Don't cut it off. You maybe fold it back and zip tie it or just find another clever way to sort of hide it within the GPU shroud so it's not that noticeable. But we'll figure it out. All right, so when you think that your computer build is done, as this looks like it's mostly done, uh, yeah, I mean, it might be business in the front, but it's still party in the back. We gotta do some wire management. So a lot of the times these cases, they have tie down points where you can loop Velcro straps like this or zip ties, and you can loop them together to hold cables down. And they're very useful. So the more they have, the better, because a lot of the times if they're not there and you need them, that could be a problem. Fortunately, this case appears to have enough of them, so let's get to it. I'm gonna be using these Velcro straps that were included with the, uh, the EVGA power supply, so that'll be nice. And there we go, basic wire management job. Let's go ahead and put the back panel on and give this thing a test boot. So once you're here, you can press F11. I already have the flash drive for the Windows 10 installation there, but F11 will get you into the boot menu. However, that may be a different key for your motherboard, so make sure you, you pay attention to that. It may also just boot directly to it, whatever the case is. If, if you make it to a boot selection, select the flash drive, and we're gonna boot to the flash drive. Here we go. And so now we're on to the Windows 10 installation. We're gonna press next, press install now, and you're gonna go through this process. If you have any questions on installing or creating a Windows 10 flash drive, we'll leave a link in the description down below in order for you to get to this step. Now, you may be presented with this part here where it says activate Windows. This is where you wanna enter your product key and then press next. And assuming the product key validates, then you'll be good to go. Uh, I don't have a product key yet, so I'm gonna click I don't have a product key. And then I'm gonna select my version of Windows, Windows 10 Pro 64. Next. Now, if you input your product key, you will be presented with the next screen. And uh, yeah, so you wanna accept a license term, assuming everything is good. And that if it activated, again, this is what you get. So then you just press next, click custom install Windows only. And then make sure that there's only one partition here. So delete anything that's there, assuming you're on a blank drive. We're just going to be going on to whole, one whole blank thing. So we're going to delete both of these partitions and start with a fresh blank. And here we go. There we go. The drive zero, unallocated space. That's the right size for the SSD that we put in. Press next and you are off to the races. After the first reboot, you can take the flash drive out of the computer, let Windows completely install, run your Windows updates to get as up-to-date as, as necessary. While you're under a clean OS install, you'll have the best chances of the most success with your Windows updates at that point, and you'd be ready to rock.
All right, so the build is complete. Got to get the panels on. But at this point in the video, you've probably already seen the Windows installation procedure as well. So hopefully you guys find that all doable, easy, easy to follow, useful, entertaining. I don't know any of all that stuff. Click the like button if you liked it. Subscribe. We always got more coming. Make sure to subscribe because we still have more coming on this build, by the way, uh, how we're going to upgrade it and also how we're going to stream and game on it at the same time. We'll see what this is really capable of. And uh, yeah, so make sure you hit that subscribe button and we'll see you guys in the next video. Bye. So we have a lot of other content available as well as other build videos, tech reviews, uh, tutorials, and all sorts of stuff like that. That'll be linked right over here. Make sure you check out one of these videos because maybe you'll find it entertaining or useful. Check it out. Click one. Come on. Click it.